Okay, so first is uh, goodness of fit. I guess I'm not sure how many people know what the goodness of fit is, especially those who are coming from the health background. So to explain that one, I thought maybe I'll start with the example, with the first one is a real example. Oh, sorry, both are real examples, but first one is very, very fresh. I became a grandfather on 5th of March, and uh, just a day or two ago, my daughter called, and she said, oh, my, my uh, grandson weight is only, uh, I guess I put the number seven, but it was much less than that one. She says, I'm concerned that this is not, he is not gaining weight, maybe I'm not eating right food, I'm not giving nutritious you know, meal to him, so I'm concerned. Uh, then I, I said, okay, uh, maybe it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, let's let's look, look into it, or you go and see a doctor. That's the one thing. Second, second example is <coughs> a response time. I think all medical students should be knowing or must know what response time is. It's simply a time interval <coughs> from the time a treatment is administered to the time its reaction appears. An individual may be concerned that he or she did not experience any desired reaction to the treatment after some, say, fixed unit of time T. And that's why they want to again go and consult the doctor. Okay, so far so good. So what happens next? Well, our aim is not the question. Our aim is to understand what is the goodness of it. But to, uh, to address that, first address the concern of the mother in the first example. For that one, well, I did not do that with my daughter because she is also a statistician. But when you become a mom, this is what happens. I'll tell you what happens. The moms have brain in their head, sorry, brain in their heart, and heart in their brain. So they cannot think logically. Sorry, moms, but that's why it is, that's a love. Anyway, so even though she's a statistician, she's concerned. So I said, I said to myself, let's look at the growth chart. And here is a growth chart. Most of you must have seen this one, but I'm going to go to background behind that one. So here, you can see, uh, you can see the age, roughly speaking, you can, you can uh, figure that one out at what is the eight month is, that is a very forced line and slightly below that one. And you can see that there are three lines coming out of that one. The lowest line is, says that 5% of the kids will have a weight around that time. And top line shows that 95% of the kids will have a weight around whatever that is. And middle line is say 50% will be around that line. Okay, so we, are, we understand that one. The question is, question is, <coughs> Uh, how that curve is prepared. Well, there, is, there are more to it, but I'll just restrict to the only one particular point. So what I can say is that, le well, let's, let's think about enough number of eight month old boys, and let's assume that we know their weights as well. Well, collect the data, and again, I'm not going to illustrate something that I thought might be, but again, there are no matter what background you are, you learn something called histogram, maybe in year eight, nine, 10. So I decided not to go into that one. So you all know we have this data and we can plot a histogram. So there, is, there you go, there's a histogram. So what does this histogram tell us? Not much, but then I'll go and look at the other curve. So this is something called as normal <coughs> distribution, normal curve, and uh, again, as I say, I'm weak link or a misfit here because I never use PowerPoint, I use take LaTeX to present, so I tried my best to overlay these two pictures on top of each other, I failed. But the point is that if you see the second curve here and if you lay over, over 
this superimposed on this graph, you will find that it probably approximates very closely. Ah, this histogram though, whatever you have, you can take another set of, another set of same number of boys and a plot histogram, might have reasonably the same shape but may not be exactly the same as this one. Okay. But this is a true curve, this is a true curve meaning if you were to take all those boys of eight months old, whenever they're born, doesn't matter, you can take a data all along the last 100 years, and when they were eight months old and their weight, and then collect that one and draw it, and then their probability distribution or the curve or what you call will look like this normal curve. Okay? Meaning, meaning, whatever this histogram is, it's a kind of sample from this population. It's just representative of that one. That is what we think about. And therefore, we'll take this curve and see with this curve what happens. If, again, I suspect uh, all 50% uh, of the uh, students here might be bored and all those things. But well, what happens is, if you go one standard deviation from mean on either direction, 68% of the data will lie in that one. Meaning, 68% of the kids will have a weight between one standard deviation or one unit of that one from the average weight. And if you go two standard deviation, well, 95% of the kids will have that. And that is exactly the point. If you go back to our this curve, we say 95 and 5, that basically giving the two end points, and that is how they plot this curve. In fact, this could be repeated at every age, and that is how we'll get the curve. Of course, that is not exactly what they did. There is something called as uh, quantile regression. But essential point is what I just described. So what is the goodness of it? Well, so what we have assumed is that normal curve, a normal distribution, approximates the histogram reasonably well. Reasonably well in the quotation mark. And um, well, what the reasonable means? A normal distribution is a good fit, right? Meaning you buy a jacket, it fits you a little bit here or there. It's a good fit. It's exactly the same meaning. Nothing different than that one. It's simply a curve to histogram. But that is a bit subjective. And statistics can be used to bring more objectivity in saying whether the normal distribution is a good fit or not, and that is what a goodness of fit means, right? Just like, now this, this is objective, we have to do objectively, uh, not subjectively, one person says that's a good fit, others is not a good fit, because even though I said similar to saying that whether the jacket fits you or not, but the jacket fitting is individual, you're buying your own jacket, some people like, you know, slim, uh, slim sleeves, somebody like tight in the waist or whatever it is, but that is not the case here, it should be overall a good fit, okay? Yes, and that object objectivity could be provided by statistics. Okay, let's, let's move on, let's see something more about it. Thank you. So now let's go back to second problem, that is response time. So exactly whatever we did for this eight month old baby's weight, we can do the same thing for this response time. Uh, that is, get enough number of patients or individuals, give you administer the same treatment and record their response time. And for the heck of, I guess most likely that is true. In that case, if you plot a histogram, it is likely it may not look the way we saw the early histogram. It might look the kind of that you have seen here, right? Meaning, what you see is, well, majority of the people, reaction time is quite quick, and there's a very small proportion which have a very late reaction time, okay? And that is possible. Now here, we can do exactly what we did for earlier, but not, not the same kind of curve, because normal curve, we saw it's quite center and symmetric, what, what not. It doesn't look like that we can superimpose and give good approximation to this histogram. 
So let's look at various different kind of probability curves. And uh, statistics or priority is very rich in the sense that there are lots of different standard probability models about which we know almost everything. And one of the curve looks like this one. Well, those who know it could be beta, sorry, it could be gamma, or log normal, log normal, what it is. And then we can see how that curve superimposes on that one and see whether it fits or not. And if it's a good fit, good. Once it is a good fit, again, I'm talking subjectively, if it's a good fit, then to estimate, then, in, then we can figure it out what proportion of the people from this population will have response time less than 30 hours, or less than 20 hours, or more than 40 hours. Right? Once we know that one, then if the patient comes to you and you say that I haven't got this uh, reaction yet, so you will say it's, it's fine, it's not a worry, because only if, only if, if at a certain thing, suppose that after 40, only 5% of the people have reaction time more than 40 hours, then you'll say, yeah, maybe things to worry about, it may not be really happening, and then you should start worrying about it, not before that. Just like with eight-month-old baby, uh, literally this will happen. In the particular case that, that I talked about, I, my daughter did go and s see his doctor. She, she said, no, don't worry. It was a 5%. She said, don't worry, it's a normal. And that is true. Similarly here, even sometimes you go to 30 hours, it's normal. People do get some time longer too, uh, because they have uh, comorbidity or something, and they might take longer to uh, show reaction. OK. So again, this is application of goodness or fit. So now in this case, as I already told you from this slide, uh, but we use this new probability distribution to decide whether it is useful or unusable to have to wait t units of time to see the reaction to the treatment. So if the patient comes with t units of time, then you can tell him, uh, you can advise help him appropriately or treat him appropriately. Okay, now, I will, and actually I have left mathematics of this goodness of it out completely. But it is available in most of the elementary statistics books. But anybody wants to think entirely how it could be done, then, then I'm open for discussion. Oh. So how it can be done? Well, simply find anomaly kind of thing. Okay, let, let's take example for that one, quick example, which doesn't require paper and pencil. Now, suppose, suppose, let's assume, let's assume uh, your COVID is not discriminating, I mean, it, it was, but I'm saying just take our argument, assume that COVID is not discriminating against the age. Very fine, uh, very, uh, fine disease, does, does not discriminate, good. So you, gotta pay, you have a patient, and then you want, to, you want to actually test the hypothesis that it does not discriminate, meaning it is uniform across all ages, so you get all patients, you have, you have patients uh, with the, uh, under 10 year, uh, between 10, 20, 20, 30, 30, 40, et cetera, et cetera, all right. And then you have the total number of patients, find the relative frequency, and think about whether they all are equal or not, right? And that's whether it's uniform or not, right? Find the distance, that is, you know that what you expect and what you saw, take a difference, find any distance, you can take a distance, take a square, or whatever distance you think is appropriate, find that distance and see what you expect that distance to be, if that distance to be must have some sort of law form, and if it follows that form, yes, this is our hypothesis is true, but it's falling outside that form may not be true. Make sense? Uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are many different kinds of goodness of fit tests available in the literature. Okay, but I guess that might be enough for you to, uh, enough for you to understand what the goodness of, goodness of it used for. But now, now, if you haven't, let me ask, let me raise a couple of questions. First is, are we checking goodness of fit only for the kind of problem that just we discussed? 
or there are many other functions for which we can do goodness of it. And secondly, if you think about it, the way I did, I had a histogram and I had a priority curve and I approximated both things, right? But the histogram, when we approximate histogram with the density curve, the way, just now I said, we had, the, we had some 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, we'd find proportion, and then for expected number. That means we are approximating, approximating your histogram with not really the normal curve, but normal curve is approximated to the histogram, and then we compare those things, right? And that may not be right. So the question could be, can we, can we have, uh, rather than the fixed histogram, a uh, histogram of which the wind width comes smaller and smaller, or sm some smooth curve you draw out of that histogram, and then compare with the standard probability curve, that might be more right. Uh, whether that is what one should do or not. That's what the couple of questions. Second question is where the research is, and let's not go there, but there are different methods to do it. Okay, uh, but the first question that we can answer, and uh, that is this one. Uh, yes, I could fill in before we go into that one, what it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure everybody understand failure rate. But I can tell you what the, what the failure rate uh, descriptively. Uh, as for, let's, let's not about anything else, let's talk human beings. At the, when, when the baby is born, at initial stages, the chances of its survivor are very low, and as it's, that the baby settles down, then it is, it doesn't, a chance, its probability of dying is very less, and it settles down, and as you go, you know, your other children is go old, again, the chances of dying are very high, and that, that's why the failure rate is high initially, comes down small and up there. Incidentally, this is the case even for many electronic component as well. And in fact, if you're not aware, in some of the tools they use in the plane, or the, I don't know what, items, article, whatever they use, components, they have this structure that is settling in period, that is a force line, and then wear out period, they're, they're, they're worn out. And in fact, they estimate that one, and actually they use, uh, they, they replace the part when it wears out, and they put it in when it settles in. That is what they do there. Okay, so this is, again, the curve is this thing. So again, we want to find for a given, sorry, for a given component or given material life, whatever we are observing, the, the whatever uh, time variable we are observing, lifetime variable observing, life of human, life of component, life of whatever it is, car, tire, where we expect some sort of curve, and again, similar kind of concept could be used, and check the, we can check the goodness of fit, etc. So there are some other functions which I'm not going to go into, but there are the functions like, uh, sorry, so other functions like a uh, survival curve, uh, hazard rate survival curve, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And I guess already answered the second question, didn't I? Yes, I think I went ahead and already talked about it, so let's pass on that one. So well, uh, I'm not sure how much I helped you, whether I succeeded. Uh, walking on that bridge and crossing the bridge and reaching you or not, but let me close this section with the latest reference that uh, that actually I did work on, and which was another attempt to do a work which could be read by people, not by statistics, but people outside statistics. That's why you can see the journal there, which is Statistics in Biosciences, and it was last year's paper, okay? All right, so that's where I'll stop about the uh, goodness of it, unless you have any questions. Any question? Go ahead.
So uh, the uh, present. The presentation was really good, sir. But uh, with respect to a kernel density estimate, where we uh, draw curves which approximate uh, a histogram, right? Mm -hmm. So th that's how we uh, draw the curved approximate. But the point is that uh, in some practical scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, we don't get to compare whatever distributions we just have. Because uh, when we do a goodness of it, we try to compare whatever uh, the distribution w of the data is similar to an existing distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what if I have to compare two different, uh, I have a distribution which is not too very predefined. Mm -hmm. So it is based on the data. In that case, what are the types of goodness of fit tests uh, we have? Good point. Actually, goodness of fit has to have certain model behind it. But the new, not new now, 30, 40 years in existence, something called smoothing methodology, a curve estimation. Initially, the curve estimation part was simply estimating the curve. Now we have made a lot of progress, so it branch stands on its south, meaning we can estimate actual curve reasonably well and use that curve itself to predict what is the 5%, 10%, all those things. So there is no as such a goodness of it because, because there may not be appropriate model which describe that particular phenomena. So let the date, the term they use, a the buzzword they use, a the cliche they use, is let data speak for itself and we get the curve and that curve we use for inference. And that theory is quite rich now. We can find confidence interval, we can find test, no, sorry, we, we can have confidence interval for those uh, using those curves as well, okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, go ahead. Uh, so, so, uh, so we have chi-square uh, test for goodness of fit, mm -hmm. like that is one test for mm -hmm. which we test goodness mm -hmm. of fit for. So like what are the other methods that we can use? Oh, there are hundreds of methods. I don't want to go to the list. There's Kodmogor Smirnov. If you, if you remember the name, there's a Kodmogor Smirnov, there are Bikel, Rosenblatt. So there are lots of different procedures. In fact, if you see the, if you see mathematical statistics paper, Oh, there are. In fact, you can see my test next month, which will coming out in Journal of Multivariate Analysis. So there are many, many procedures. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, but like, is there any bifurcation between these tests? Tests like, like, if we use chi square, it will be better in this situation. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, good point. It actually, it is. It is. Look, uh, let me let me make a comment about the chi square test first, which I should have done at the very beginning. It's off the line digression, but I'll I'll come back to you. You know what? Uh, Chi-square test of goodness of it, you'll be surprised, some people may not, some people may know it. It is one of the top, top 10 technological breakthroughs of the last century. And that was, that you must have surprised, that is one of the tech. Anyway, so coming to the question, the chi-square test is okay in the last century, even it's okay a lot of times, but as I said, the, it assumes, it compares, uh, not that histogram, not with the normal distribution. It compares that histogram with the normal distribution, which is actually a constant on each interval. That is the distribution you're comparing, not with normal distribution. And therefore, if, if, you, if you allow, if, if you actually get a smooth curve and compare normal, we might get slightly different distribution. The test may not be chi-square. The test might have some different distribution, normal distribution for that matter. Okay? All right? Okay. All right. Shall I move on? All right. Somebody say anything? No. Okay. So here is another point, another thing uh, I'm interested in is the Symmetry. Well, this may not be true for the response time. All right. So what is symmetry? Well, most likely it is what I think it is, as you'll see. I'm not going to put, bring a different example. I'll just go with the same example and explain the symmetry. And again, the one, the symmetry that I'm going to show in this example, I'm not sure it is, it is, uh, as useful 
in the medical sciences as such may be useful for the publications in medical science when they have publication bias or something that's where the symmetry comes in but let's not go there let's understand the concept of symmetry straight uh, straightforward okay so uh, let's go back to weight of eight month old boys suppose 50 percent of boys weight above eight kilogram and 50 percent weight below eight kilogram right so that's basically center after that one if the proportion of boys above 8 plus whatever some number fixed w and 8 minus w kg then find the proportion of boys above 8 plus w find the proportion of 8 minus w and do it for every possible w w is equal to 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 whatever it is and if that proportion is same for every w well your data is symmetric around that 8 kg and we say we have the symmetry in the distribution of weights of eight month old babies. Okay. But this may not be true for the response time. That is, the response time may not be symmetric in the sense that we just saw. And as I said, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, this univariate symmetry has any significance in the medical field straight away. It might be, but I'm not aware of, but I'm not, I'm, I haven't come across. But if it is, it might be useful to know how symmetric the core is or how, or, or maybe can we quantify the size of O symmetry. And for that one, let me show you something here. So this is, uh, left hand side what I have is a standard curve a probability curve and right hand side I have a cumulative distribution curve and here I think you are going to learn something about correlation covariance later on in the today's talks and if you see the covariance thing covariance zero it does not imply independence but there is one thing one thing about the covariance you might know which is which is if you have two variables, one is constantly increasing, second is increase up to certain point and then start decreasing. That means force these two variables go together and then they go different direction. And that is where it becomes zero if the rate at which they go in direction it matches. And that exactly what happens in the symmetric distribution here, that is the forced variable goes up and come down Whereas if you think about cumulative distribution function, it keeps going up up to that center point and again keeps going up. At the, the rate at which goes up is same as the rate at which this function goes up. But the rate at which this goes down, it exactly opposite rate it goes down. And therefore, if you were to find covariance between that one, it will be zero. A covariance zero, correlation zero. That means find a correlation between fx and fx and if this zero, this implies symmetry, and uh, higher the value of this correlation, higher is the symmetry, and zero is, no, uh, it's a symmetry. But incidentally, this quantification or this measure, what I just described roughly, it is not all weather. There are lots of shortcomings. Uh, that could be sorted out, but to, to explain, I thought that might be the uh, uh, best place to explain how to quantify that. But as I said, the, the, and here is here is to illustrate how good or bad it is. You can see this each curve as you from your black to red to green to blue get more and more and more asymmetric, right? And I guess those numbers mean something else. But I forgot to put the I forgot to put the, the quantification of asymmetry there. If you look at the first black curve. The size of O symmetry is 0.1. That is very close to symmetry. Go to the next one, the kind of major I just described, find the covariance, oh, sorry, correlation between the density and the uh, cumulative distribution function. The second one, the rate, the, the quantification is 0.2. Symmetry is 0.2. Then you go to the next one, it is 0.3. The next go, 0.4. So it is getting more and more O symmetry. Uh, that is the usefulness of that quantification more it's on the scale zero to one for being a correlation coefficient okay 
But as I said, that may not be that interesting, but to go to explain where the, where the symmetry would be useful uh, in the medical field, I had to go for inverse symmetry because the concept is simple. Now, let's think about that concept of symmetry to, to extend to the, to extend to the two variables and one gets many different types of bivariate -right symmetry. Well, we don't have much time to go into all different kinds of symmetry, so I'll simply pay, uh, restrict my attention to the kind of symmetry that would be useful in medical field. Um, that is, say, you have X and Y, the two kinds of measurement we've made, and then that this measurement FXY is, if you swap Y and X, it's the same thing, FYX. Well, this is the probability density function, but could be anything else as well. And I can give a quick example, where for example, X can be measurement on the left hand or I, and the Y is the measurement on the right hand or I, right? And those will be, those, I expect those measurement to be symmetric. In fact, in fact, uh, there is, there is uh, uh, usefulness of this one, you can see in this paper, uh, bivariate, <coughs> somebody called Buchmeier's, oh, sorry, Huster, Buchmeier, and Self had studied uh, this diabetic retinopathy data on 197 patient of whom one eye was randomly selected for treatment and both eyes were followed up until blindness or sensory. That means they were actually studying the bivariate failure rate. The failure rate we already talked about, they thought that failure rate would be symmetric and that is what they were testing there. So this bivariate symmetry is useful, uh, but, but I actually, I'm, I don't think, well, there is, there is some sort of, some sort of contraindication already offered in finance world, and I have a different way to quantify that one, but I guess I haven't yet reached that point, but maybe another six months I will be able to provide, uh, I might, I might uh, provide uh, interesting to me at least I think is interesting quantification of this bivariate or symmetry. Okay, I guess there are only a few minutes remaining and I think I should stop here uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, okay? All right. Thank you very much, thank you for listening.